I woke up one day and had a very simple thought. Why can't I just do what I know would be good for me? Have you ever had that thought? Well, picture yourself with a deadline for two months from now. You're supposed to research for a paper, uh, maybe study for an exam, or write the first draft for a TED Talk. You tell yourself that this time, you're going to start working on it as soon as possible, so you don't end up rushing it on the last week. Well, then the next day comes, and now you're telling yourself, eh, I have so much more time left. Suddenly, the deadline is tomorrow, and you're staring at an empty page that reads TED Talk First Draft. Uh, don't worry, this is the completed version, and by the end of this, maybe you won't go through that. Now, like the chronic procrastinator I used to be, I closed the tab that read TED Talk First Draft, went to Google, and began searching how to be more productive. Why do I procrastinate? How to increase motivation? And the results I got for these three questions were terrible. They were clearly written by people that didn't understand the problem. Article after article. I kept seeing the same keywords over and over and over again. The same keywords I keep hearing at the introduction of every class. Have you ever heard these keywords before? Time management. Time management. Time management. The advice that for me to complete something on time, I have to start working on it on time? It's not really helpful, is it? So I decided to dig a little deeper and really ask the question, why do we procrastinate? And after a lot of research, I found out that it actually has nothing to do with time management and everything to do with mood management. You see, when we boil it down to the fundamentals, everything we do, the way we feel, from if we're happy or sad, excited or motivated, it has to do with the given state of the chemicals in our brain. Uh, for example, we've all been angry before, right? And the person you are when you're angry, it's not the person you are in reality. And being hangry is just what happens when we don't eat for a long period of time. Our glucose levels start dropping, your body thinks you're dying, and starts releasing all these stress chemicals like cortisol and adrenaline. And suddenly you're not just hungry, you're hangry. Now, that's a chemical in the brain that causes stress and irritability. But we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about the chemical that makes us motivated. The chemical that makes us want to get up and do the dishes, write that final paper, or even scroll to the next TikTok. We're talking about the neuromodulator called dopamine. Now, you may have heard of dopamine being a reward chemical, where you get spikes of it when you're happy. Yeah, but that's not exactly accurate. Dopamine has little to do with pleasure and happiness, and more to do with motivation. It's the chemical that controls whether you get up and be in pursuit of the things that you want. Well, how do we know? How do we know that dopamine is less of a pleasure chemical and more of a motivation chemical? Well, there's a great experiment that explains this really well. Imagine a mouse in a box. Inside that box is a lever that, when pressed by the mouse, releases it food. The scientists observe that when the mouse presses the lever and eats its food, it gets a spike of dopamine. It feels happy. But is dopamine the reason it's happy? Well, to find that out, the scientists took the mouse out of the box 
surgically remove the part of the brain that releases dopamine and put the mouse right back in the box next to the lever. Uh, the scientists then saw that, well, the mouse still presses the lever, still eats its food, and is still clearly happy. The interesting part, though, was, well, the scientists now moved the mouse away from the lever, and now suddenly, the mouse didn't have the motivation to go back to the lever. Suddenly, the mouse couldn't do what it knew was good for it, and eventually died of hunger. That just goes to show how important dopamine is to keeping our motivation levels in check. Well, now that we know that dopamine is a motivation chemical and not a pleasure chemical, well, how does it work? How it works is simple. The first thing we need to know is that everyone, including all animals, have a baseline level of dopamine. Building from that, think of dopamine as a process with three stages. The first stage is the initial desire. This is what happens when we get a craving for something. Maybe we want to eat that burger. Maybe we want to look at our phone. That desire gives you a subconscious euphoria that brings your dopamine above the baseline. Then we move to stage two, which I call the pain-induced drop. What happens here is your brain realizes that you desire something, but it also realizes that you don't have it. What happens there is that pain causes your dopamine to fall below the baseline, moving to stage three. What happens here is your brain realizes that it's no longer at the baseline, it's below, and wants to bring it right back. So the key takeaway here is when dopamine falls below the baseline, your brain wants to bring it back up, and it wants to bring it back up by going after something that brings you pleasure and brings it to you fast, like looking at your phone or eating that burger. But definitely not something like sitting down and studying. Well, now that we know how dopamine works, well, how do we use that information? Well, picture this. It's the winter vacation. And my schedule is filled with never-ending scrolls through TikTok, long Netflix binges, and a very unhealthy obsession with Cyberpunk 2077. It's around this time that I started researching into this topic, and I decided, hey, let me use what I learned to change my schedule, to manage my mood. Uh, fast forward to the end, and my schedule looks a lot healthier. So how did I make this happen? Let's look at the schedule again, but this time, let's look at that transition point from before and after. You'll notice that I'm still going through these Netflix binges, I'm still going through a lot of gaming sessions, but you'll notice that after I wake up, I'm now going to the gym. But how did I make that happen? What did I change in my schedule to have more motivation in the morning? You'll see that before, I used to go through social media as soon as I woke up. So, what's the relationship between social media and dopamine? Let's take TikTok for example. Well, what happens with TikTok? There's a purpose behind it. You're motivated to find the best videos. Well, what happens before you engage in TikTok? Well, stage one, the initial desire. Maybe you see a notification on your phone. Maybe your friend sends you a link. That gives you that initial desire, which brings your dopamine above the baseline. Then comes stage two, the pain-induced drop. You realize that you're not on TikTok, and then brings your dopamine back to the baseline. Then we move to stage three. You click on the link, and now you're going through TikTok. But there's something strange here. Because, you see, TikTok, well, they know you algorithmically better than anyone else. What happens is that when you're on TikTok, well, they know the videos that you really like and that you don't like and gives it to you at the perfect time. 
You get videos that you really like that brings your dopamine back to the baseline. And then you see videos that are not that interesting, which brings you below the baseline. Suddenly, you're going between these stages over and over and over again, keeping you on that app for as long as possible. So what happens after your TikTok session? Well, you're just left with far less dopamine than you started with. So by simply cutting out social media or even your smartphone entirely after you wake up, you're going to have a lot more dopamine to do the things that you want, like going to the gym. Now, the gym is great and all, but it's a plus. Maybe we want to work on the next thing. Maybe we want to sit down and learn how to do origami. Maybe we want to study Einstein's model of general relativity and how quantum mechanics doesn't really agree with it. And that's going to take a lot more dopamine. So this begs the question, what can we do to increase our dopamine in a prolonged fashion? Not just get a few quick peaks and have it reduced later, but increase it by 250% over a prolonged period of time. Well, there was a study done, and essentially what it showed was that if you immerse yourself in ice-cold water for around nine minutes, you get a 2.5 times increase in your dopamine. Suddenly, you have a lot more energy to do what you know would be good for you. And you can see the effects of this in my schedule. You'll see that after coming home from the gym and engaging in these ice baths, I've now replaced that Netflix session with a study session. So at the end of the day, what do we really take away from any of this? Well, if you want your TED Talk to be on time, well, then remember that it's never about time management and always about mood management. Don't check your phone in the morning. Do an ice bath before you begin working and profit. Do this and suddenly you'll see yourself procrastinating less and being happier every day. Thank you.